Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Joseph Altschuler. Uh, I'm a faculty member here at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago's Department of Architecture, Interior Architecture, and Designed Objects. Uh, and I'm also the curator of our, of our small but, but impactful hallway gallery, a dedicated gallery space to architecture, interior architecture, and designed objects on the 12th floor of the Sullivan Building uh, here in downtown Chicago. Uh, and I'm thrilled to welcome you all to this closing discussion of uh, Joshua G. Stein's recent exhibit, Discard Archive. Uh, for those of you who may not know, Joshua Stein uh, was the uh, visiting Mitchell professor uh, of, in, our, in the previous academic year. Uh, and I had the pleasure of working with Joshua to curate and install an exhibit in our space. Uh, kind of very well timed in March of, of 2020. Uh, we installed the exhibit and the school promptly closed. Uh, and I think that uh, the exhibit, which then existed with many non-humans for months, I'm sure has lots of stories to tell us about um, the non-human communities that maybe joined it in, in those months. But tonight, I'm excited to revisit it uh, on the occasion of its closing. Um, We'll welcome you on a, on a kind of virtual walkthrough of the exhibit, um, uh, which you'll hear lots more about. And we're also going to invite two special guests to join us tonight and, and to engage in a conversation with Joshua. Uh, and I'll, I'll introduce them all now. Uh, so first, uh, Joshua G. Stein is the founder of Radical Craft, a Los Angeles-based studio that advances an experimental art and design practice saturated in history, archeology, span and craft. Um, this inquiry involves the production of urban spaces and artifacts uh, by evolving uh, newly grounded approaches to the challenges posed by virtuality, velocity, and globalization. Uh, Stein is the author of Trajan's Hollow, which examines the role of craft and reproduction in the era of digital scanning and fabrication. And he's also the co-editor of Dingbat 2.0, uh, the first full-length publication on the iconic Los Angeles apartment building type. He's received numerous grants, awards, and fellowships, uh, including multiple grants from the Graham Foundation. Uh, and he's also the 2010-2011 uh, Rome Prize uh, winner for the Fellowship in Architecture. He's a former member of the LA Forum of the uh, Board of Directors and has taught at the California College of Arts, Cornell University, Sci Arc, the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design, uh, and most recently, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, right here, uh, where he was the Mitchell Visiting Professor. And he's currently the Professor of Architecture at Woodbury University, where he also directs the Institute of uh, Material Ecologies. Um, in just a little bit, we're also going to be joined by Paula Aguirre, uh, who is the founder of Borderless, a Chicago-based urban design and research practice focused on cultivating collaborative design agency through interdisciplinary projects. Uh, with an emphasis on exchange and communication across disciplines, Borderless explores creative civic design and engagement interventions um, that address the complexity of urban systems and social equity by looking at intersections between architecture, urban design, infrastructure, landscape planning, and community participatory processes. Paula is an active educator, uh, also a dear friend and colleague of ours here at SAIC, uh, and she's also taught at the Sam Fox School of Design in Washington University in St. Louis uh, and ArchiWorks. Uh, and we're also, I'm thrilled to, thrilled to share, joined by Del Harrow, uh, who lives and works in Fort Collins, Colorado. He is an associate professor at Colorado State University, where he teaches sculpture, digital fabrication, and ceramics. His art practice spans genres of sculpture and design and integrates traditional manual and skill-based forming processes with digital fabrication technology. Harrow has lectured widely on his own work and on the intersection of digital fabrication and craft in contemporary art and education. His work has been exhibited at the Milwaukee Art Museum, the Denver Art Museum, Arizona State University Art Museum, the Vox Populi Gallery, the Museum of Fine Art in Boston, and others. Uh, Harrow is the recipient of the 2020 United States Artist Fellowship. 
Uh, we're super excited to have them all here to uh, kind of hear some conversation on the intersection of urban design and ceramics, digital fabrication, and geology. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joshua, who is going to uh, launch you into a virtual walkthrough of the exhibit. Thank you, Joseph. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, yeah, maybe to just uh, explain the, the format a little bit. Um, we'd love it if everybody could mute themselves for definitely the first portion of this um, for the while we kind of do the, the virtual walkthrough um, with the video and then also for the first portion of the discussion between um, me, Dell, and Paula. And then afterwards, I think maybe what we can start with is when people have some questions, they can put them in the chat box and that, that's just a way for us to keep track of who's asking questions and we can ask you to say those out loud or we can read them for you. Um, and then we'll, we'll see how that goes and allow things to devolve as necessary. Um, so I wanted to um, maybe start by saying that this project is very much about landscapes and land and who has access to the land as well as the right to the city. Um, it fast forwards and ignores some, or, or just moves past some earlier issues that I would just like to acknowledge um, in terms of number one, the, the Art Institute of Chicago. Can you um, is located on the traditional homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and the Potawatomi Nations. And because this project also is so much about um, the city and the metropolis of Buffalo, um, I'd also like to acknowledge that the, the territory that Buffalo is now located in is a part of the territory of the Seneca Nation, a member of the Haudenosaunee and the Six Nations Confederacy. Um, and there are some other uh, acknowledgements that I'd love to make. Number one, I do really appreciate the opportunity from the School of the Art Institute, um, in particular AIADO, the Department of Architecture, Interior Architecture and Designed Objects, um, the opportunity to teach for one year and to also exhibit this project and initiate and advance another project which is closely related to this one, um, which I call the Geological Atlas of the Built Metropolis. Um, and I had a great time working with the students and the faculty at the school. The, the last thank yous that I should make um, are uh, to the funding sources and also the residencies that really made this project possible. Um, first of all, Woodbury University, my home university, and a faculty grant that I received from Woodbury and then a residency at the Casa das Caldeiras in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and then another residency in Buffalo at the um, University of Buffalo Creative Arts Initiative. So as Joseph mentioned, um, you know, one of, the, one of the problems was that of course, when, when uh, lockdown hit, we had, I think one day before uh, finalized um, and finished the install. Um, and so, in a way, nobody was really able to see it in person. I'm not able to welcome you in person um, to the gallery, but um, I was fortunate enough to get connected with uh, some great um, young filmmakers called On The Real, who helped me and basically visited and put together this walkthrough um, that I think we can start by showing. And then I will, um, while this is playing, it's about a five minute video, but what I will do is put up, um, in case there are any problems with the video quality, I'm putting a link in the chat box to the same video on Vimeo. And so anybody should feel free to watch along there. Um, but first of all, we'll just watch this short video and then Hopefully we can get a little bit of an understanding of um, what things look like in terms of these objects and the process behind them. And then afterwards, we'll try unpack that together with Dell, with Paula, and um, with everybody else who'd love to join in. Um, so let's see if we can get the video running. Oh. 
My name is Joshua Stein. We are at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago right now, and this is Discard Archive, an installation based on approximately six or seven years of unfolding research into the metropolis and who has access to the metropolis, particularly through public transit and infrastructure. These are basically molds that were used to produce 13 different ceramic chunks that create a landscape for the city of Buffalo that explains how long it takes to move through the city on public transportation. I call this an isochronic mountain, this landscape of time. And that comes from this idea of isochronic mapping. These maps basically make rings that are separated by equal segments of time. If you draw a line on a map or a circle on a map that determines how long it takes for you to move through the city, you can imagine it's maybe something like this big in five minutes. And if you had 10 minutes, maybe you could walk this far. And if you had 15 minutes, maybe you could walk this far. If you got on a bike, if you got on a bus and you headed in one direction, that might start to change and it's no longer a circle anymore. And if you had a network of buses, that map of simple concentric circles starts to become quite complex. If you were to imagine what that would look like three-dimensionally, that's what we have when I talk about an isochronic mountain. And some of what's on the other side of the exhibition space are a series of earlier studies on isochronic mountains started in Sao Paulo. I was on a residency in Sao Paulo, Brazil, which we're trying to understand what it would mean to pick one point in the city and then see how long it would take to get there by public transit, to get to the peak of the mountain, which in this case, the destination point was Buffalo City Hall. That is isochronic mountain Buffalo. After completing that project, I realized that I had these amazing molds, these plaster molds, which captured all of this information. And they were also, I believed, beautiful sculptures in and of their own right. But then also from an earlier research project, I remembered that there's this history of plaster casts that have been used inside of museums for hundreds of years. People going to Southern Europe, going to Italy, going to Greece, and making casts of these statuary and then bringing those plaster casts back up to Northern Europe and exhibiting them, painting them so that they looked like the original bronze statues. The opportunity here inside the hallway gallery was to show each one of these as if they were their own sculptural object, their own sculptural monument almost, just to form, to data, to landscape, without necessarily being held accountable to the landscape of Buffalo. So there's all of these steps that are involved in this process. The public won't necessarily know each one of those steps. But I do think that maybe in observing and coming up close and looking at this, you can find traces of any one of those different steps in the process. I tend to move back and forth between trying to think at the scale of just material and material process, and then also trying to be much more speculative in, in terms of what that research and what that knowledge and lessons gained would mean for rethinking the future of our city, of the way we situate ourselves in the world we exist in at the moment. This project was mostly interested in what it means to move through the city by public transit, because I think that starts to reveal for us who has access to the city. Although cities have grown over time, public transit systems have been defunded. So the city has become less and less accessible to its citizens by transit. And I think representing that information as mountains also helps us think about things in terms of erosion. We could start to imagine transit valleys, areas of the city that become deeply removed from downtown, not because of distance, but because of access through transit. What does it mean to kind of start to ignore or wall off certain parts of the city from another. There's hints of that, of the research and the process that are somehow embodied and embedded in these 13 objects behind me.
Um, so maybe at the moment now, I think it'd be nice to, to try to jump in and unpack uh, the project. And um, since we can't be there in person, try to wrap our brains around what this thing really is. Um, so one of the people that I thought would be really helpful in doing this was Del Harrow. And I met Del in like 2008, I believe, in the Netherlands on a ceramics residency. Um, and it was, for me, the, the moment where I was grappling with trying to figure out how digital fabrication, data in general, um, could meet materials. And I don't know if I knew ex exactly what that meant at the time, um, but one of the great things was that Dell happened to be at the same residency program and he was coming, um, maybe had some similar questions, but coming from a training in ceramics, which my training was definitely not in ceramics and definitely not craft-based. Um, very much coming from a digital design uh, tradition. And so it was really helpful for me to try to process these issues through um, in the presence of Dell. And then I think over the years that conversation has advanced beyond simply just technique or materials. Although for me, it has always started with that uh, relationship between technology and materials. Um, Dell and I, um, together with a, a few other people, started um, a network called the Data Clay Network, which was very much interested in trying to understand what this relationship was between digital fabrication techniques and ceramic materials. But I think also, again, this is kind of restating the same thing. I think we were trying to figure out what, how, how those issues of technique um, might grow into something beyond technique alone. So how would they start to change our theoretical or conceptual um, understanding of the world around us? And I think for, for me, I want to invite Dell into this discussion because in some ways the, the project has moved beyond clay. Um, and it's certainly moved beyond what I initially thought data meant in terms of the control and precision in digital fabrication. But I think both of those things somehow very much still inform this project. So I thought Dell might be a perfect person to help um, lift up some other layers uh, inside of this. Yeah. Well, thank, thanks so much, Joshua. Thanks for that introduction. And thank you for the invitation. I mean, I'm, I feel like I've been a huge, you know, just hugely interested in the trajectory of your work in these projects ever since we met. And it's so much fun to have this opportunity to have a more focused kind of conversation about them. Um, I mean, I guess maybe I could just kind of op open up with, with a sort of a question, which in a way I suppose is just kind of trying to speak aloud, like my, my mind kind of trying to track like the nature of this project or sort of grapple with the nature of the project. And, and you know, I'm kind of thinking about it and, and, and in a way, you know, this whole series of projects of yours, um, about Isochronic Mountain, the Isochronic Mountain series, but also in relation in some way to the Trajan's Hollow piece. And um, I don't know, like I, I sort of, I guess think of them in this way as like, you know, there's the sense in which one kind of first encounters like the, the sort of experience of, of the metropolis or a civic space or that landscape and, and the way each of us might sort of encounter that differently on a, on a bodily level, um, trying to navigate that space or move within that space. And then this way in which your project seems to, through this process of mapping or diagramming, like trying to map or make some sense, make some sort of meaningful coherence of that experience of the space and how it's different for different people. And then it feels like that becomes this kind of jumping off point where, um, you then engage, have this, have this desire to engage in then this process of taking that, that map or diagram and making it into something physical, like making it into something physical, something incredibly heavy, actually. You know? and, and there are all of these problems of, of casting this heavy, this mountain, in a way. Um, and there's something, again, I mean, as you described in the video, like something, 
I think really beautiful the way in which the physicality and the weight of that that physical kind of monument or mountain like gives some kind of visceral connection to that experience of that temporal experience and the experience of difficulty in moving through the space that that is a physical engagement with with the landscape of the metropolis but then there's this interesting way in which it feels like this project it's like this is that at another level where now we're seeing the the kind of the discarded fragments of the process um but it's physical stuff again you know and there's all of this information and texture and sort of complexity but in a way it feels like the the kind of like the the meaningful coherence which you constructed so carefully with the diagram has almost dissolved again um back into a kind of more pure kind of visceral bodily experience of physical matter and and um i don't know i mean i i guess i have a lot of thoughts about what the kind of implications of that that sort of art through the project might be but i was i guess i was wondering if you could kind of talk about that more like what I mean, what, what, what are these things at this stage in relation to that whole history, which they've moved through? Um, what are yeah, these fragments? I had, I had a lot of debates about how I would present these pieces at um, the School of the Art Institute. Um, that number one, it was, um, I decided consciously that I wanted to show them as objects, not as um, components of a mold. So I, I wanted to display them as sculptural objects so that they weren't necessarily beholden to their initial role as a tool for producing this landscape, which we can call it a kind of potentially a picturesque landscape in that it is meant to be not just a datascape, but also a mountain. You know, it is supposed to feel like um, something that you could somehow uh, climb or take a, you know, follow a trajectory on or through. And so the, the scale of that mountain was important. I didn't want it to just be something that you only observed, but I wanted it to be something that was more like at a visitor center for a national park where you could kind of put your finger on it and really locate yourself in that landscape. And if you knew Buffalo well enough, um, you could literally find where your house would be and then figure out where you were standing, which in this case would be City Hall because the, um, the mountain is displayed at City Hall. And then you could count how long it would take to get there by kind of walking up these steps in the mountain. So in a certain way, there was a, that, that was coherent, right? Like that you could, you could treat the landscape as a landscape that had, that was continuous and it was potentially mapped onto your experience of the city. But then um, I also think there was something important about the way that I needed to construct um, a ceramic object of that scale. It's basically five feet in diameter. And to produce that, there would, there would kind of be no way that somebody of my size could make a mold where they could cast, make a ceramic cast the mold would just be too large, too unwieldy. And then on top of that, there would be the question in terms of how you get that ceramic object into a kiln. So by necessity, it needed to be um, parcelized into these 13 chunks. And I think there's actually something, I, I realize this only in retrospect, that I think there was something important about that, that fact of only getting, uh, only allowing one even even myself working on these as fragments of a larger landscape in some ways that's it's the way that we all experience landscape you know we can never experience a landscape in its entirety where does it begin and where does it end right mm -hmm. um so i thought that the the fact that these started up as fragments but then maybe could become their own coherent sculptures on their own was something was kind of true to the larger concept that we might have in terms of how we deal with data, how we deal with landscape, all of these things that like are much larger 
than you know simple artifacts or objects but somehow appreciating or trying to delve into one small aspect of it does unlock or open up something for this for a larger understanding so i felt like there was a very i think simplistic but meaningful disconnect between the continuous ceramic landscape and the discontinuous plaster mold pieces which then became the sculptures that we see in this exhibition yeah i mean it it feels like there's a really um like curious way in which um like with each of these fragments there's kind of the, this overlaying of of geometry and order um, and the ordering of different kinds of systems and different kinds of logic at different points in the process of mapping, you know, building, making a mold, and, and this really interesting way in which that um, kind of overlaying feels like it, in some sense, uh, kind of reflects like the way in which those systems of order, like within a city, pile on top of each other where, you know, a, a system of roads, you know, is built upon a, a foundation of geology, you know, and then a transit system is sort of built upon um, a, a, a set of infrastructure which was pre-existent, which wasn't like predetermined, you know, there isn't necessarily a kind of um, coherence that follows, like they stack on top of each other. And there's a way in which it feels like kind of by pulling apart these fragments, it, it becomes a sort of reflection back on the kind of the sometimes the incoherence of the way these different systems which are built in a city for moving through space um, emerge in this um, organic and kind of unpredictable way. Yeah, I mean, of course, I can't say I was thinking about all of that at, at the time, you know, but I think your, um, you know, you recalling the Trajan's Hollow project that I worked on uh, um, about 10 years ago, but then the book that came out about a year ago was very much interested in issues of reproduction and fidelity or infidelity in mold cast processes. And that's a, a slight detour from what you were asking about right now, but I do think that inside of um, that understanding that I grew and developed over time, working with digital models, then producing those digital models, usually as um, a physical mold that would then have a cast that was produced out of that mold. I realized that there were so many of these techniques that were each leaving a kind of vestigial pattern or language in, in this object, in this artifact that would change over time and would contain embodied, embedded within it, all, all of these prior steps, right? And I think I decided that there was not necessarily like an issue of honesty about trying to maintain any of those prior um, kind of techniques or processes, but more an issue of opportunity that as many of those that I didn't spend extra time trying to remove or edit out of the final um, artifact, it would leave more possibilities for unzipping other unanticipated futures for those artifacts. And I think maybe what we, you know, what we have now at, in, the, in the gallery is very clearly an unexpected future. Like I had no idea when I started this project that I would be exhibiting the molds you know, that, that, that was something that I could not have conceived of at the start of the project. Um, but in some ways, never wanting to, let's say being, um, being careful to never try to erase or completely cover, cover over a process or something that might have felt like a byproduct with the goal of having this perfect data model seamlessly represented in reality. Like I think I, I was not interested in that from the get-go. I was interested in manifesting some kind of data materially, but I knew that that material manifestation 
would take this project on many, many detours, right? And so I think, of course, what, what's beautiful for me at the end of this, or at this phase of it, is that what is being exhibited is exactly a detour. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I wonder about, yeah, I mean, there, I wonder, I, w I guess I wonder if you've speculated further about, um, I mean, there's, I mean, I think there's something profound about the way in which these fragments become these sort of poetic reflections on the fragmentary nature of the city and the way in which that kind of fragmentation um, displaces, disenfranchises, you know, limits or allows access for um, different people to, to navigate that space or not in different ways. And um, simply that kind of, that the, the way in which these objects feel like they reveal something in this, again, very poetic way about that sort of fragmentation feels in, in itself to be a kind of profound gesture. Um, I wonder, are there ways sort of beyond that in which these pieces sort of reflect or in which you've speculated further about ways that they engage that idea, which you sort of introduced the project with of, you know, who has access to, to the land or landscape of, of, of the metropolis? Yeah, I and mean, I think when I started the project, since I started, I started in, um, the project in Sao Paulo, and when I was there, I, I, you know, as happens quite often when I go on a residency, I make a proposal, but I don't really know what I'm going to be doing until I land there and kind of feel my way through it. And in Sao Paulo, I was <clears throat> both looking at issues of the kind of um, auto-constructed city, meaning that people build their own houses um, especially in the favelas, and then that grows into something larger that we can call a city, but it is very much not a top-down planned uh, logic of a city. Um, and, then, and then I was also interested in just issues of infrastructure in a city that is considered one of the largest sprawling, you know, kind of messiest cities in the world. And so I had those two ideas when I went there, and, and ultimately what I ended up producing was you know, this, this artifact, the first isochronic mountain that, um, you know, was an object that was, you know, it was maybe about like this big, about um, 20 inches in diameter, but it had um, very intricate detail that showed the areas of the city that would be very difficult to access via public transit. Um, and so then in Sao Paulo, it's very extreme conditions where people would be spending up, upwards of four hours in one direction. Um, commuting. And so I, I knew that also when I was there. And for me, that was a very present issue. And I felt that the um, it was the erosion of infrastructure. And it was that idea of erosion that, that this technique of modeling and mapping that I found so compelling. And in Buffalo, that was very much the same case. At, at first, I think the reason that Buffalo felt a compelling second site for this research was because the, you know, most people there don't necessarily re really even know that there was such a robust um, transit system of, uh, you know, of streetcars that just crisscross the city. And it was the per capita, like the second most robust um, streetcar system at, at the time in the early 1900s, right next to DC. And you would never know that now because the, the city is so difficult to navigate via, via transit. And so that, that's kind of talking about the erosion issue, which is maybe more about like the larger continuous landscape that still produces pockets that are problematic. Mm -hmm. But then in terms of this issue of the kind of discontinuous or parcelized um, landscape or parcelized city, there's another history in, in Buffalo that's a little bit different. So the one that I'm talking about is maybe about neglect or just part of it is neglect. Part of it is about abandonment of earlier modes of infrastructure, you know, so just the, you know, the, the drive to move on to the next thing, you know, like we don't, we don't need streetcars. We don't need things with rails. It's so limiting, you know, like now we've got cars, you know, like why would we want to limit ourselves 
to just the rails. Once we have the roads, we can go anywhere. So this phantasm of infinite possibility that of course is accessible only to a limited number or percentage of the population. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of like the neglect version of things, mm -hmm. but there's also the, um, the maybe the more, um, the idea of walling off or carving up the city that is a little bit more intentional potentially um, and in Buffalo, that's in, in particular, the kind of carving up of the city by freeways and freeway like um, parkways that then very much segregate the city beyond what was already the case um, and, and really solidify those boundaries, which are economic and uh, racial. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the project maybe started on, on one end of things, like the kind of idea uh, that was more about landscape, geology, erosion, but then quickly needed to con confront both materially and urbanistically this kind of enclave nature and, and parcelization, um, which is equally a part of our metropolis at this moment. Yeah, I mean, that just, just in, in that sort of description of the, the um, I don't know, like the sort of fragmentation of the city as a, as a kind of, as a product of a kind of erosion, as an erosion of public infrastructure. I mean, that just feels so kind of co compelling in a sense in that, you know, in one way, I mean, I have no idea what this would mean in a practical sense, or, I mean, I'm not an urban, urban planner or a, but, but it seems to imply also some sort of notion of like, the idea of filling in that infrastructure as a sort of casting process somehow, and how would you how how would you would approach that as a as a cast in a sense? Um, and I'm not sure what the implications of that might be, but that seems like a beautiful sort of speculation on on this on this condition which the project describes. Um, I guess one of oh go ahead yeah. Yeah, I, I, um, I have never thought about the project that way, you know, so that's one, that's where you're bringing some, you're reading something new into the project that the casting process in and of itself might propose other ways of viewing the city or the kind of um, the infilling of abandoned infrastructure almost, right? Like the, the it's second, a kind of repair almost. Or... Right. I mean, what's a, another more tragic version of that is that this, the city of Buffalo didn't have the money to even remove the rails. So they just literally put, just put asphalt fault over all of them. So the entire system was literally just cast over by roads. Um, so that's, that's the more tragic version of, of what you're proposing, that a new system just infills over on top of the old one and erases it completely. I guess another question I had is, or, yeah, I guess another question I had, should I keep going or <laughs> are we still in this segment of the discussion or am I monopolizing? Keep, keep going, ask this one, monopolize for a little while longer, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, I guess in a, in a maybe slightly different direction, I mean, another aspect of, of the pieces that we're looking at in the project, which is feels so apparent is, is this, the bronze surfaces on them. And I, I guess it's a, it's a part of them that I've been incredibly curious about since I first saw them. And I, I of course, I mean, I think I shared this. I first assumed that they were cast in bronze. Um, and then that when you, you know, when you explain that they were actually a bronze, like a faux bronze surface, and then the, the references there with, you know, museums that showed fragments of molds that had bronze surfaces, like, I, I find that, I mean, in a way, even, even more interesting and complex and layered. Um, I feel like it brings up, you know, all of these um, ideas about like hierarchies of materials, um, like what material is a finished material, what material is a material that's just about process. Um, through that, like ideas about craft and both like, kind of craft in the sense of like, like the historical museums you described, which are showing like, you know, the, the process of objects, which are um, artifacts of the process of making things, but also like a more kind of like low C or like, 
you know, another, another use of craft where, I mean, the faux bronze is like, it makes me think of like craft stores and like sort of faux, faux finishes and faux surfaces. Um, so I don't know. I mean, there's just a, a sort of a, a complexity in terms of like the, the associations and kind of range of, of meanings of that surface, which you've applied, um, which I don't know. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, I mean, um, I think like a lot of that I discovered, but let's say the potential for even exhibiting these molds, I think comes from the research that I was doing for the Trajan's Hollow project, which was very much looking into these cast galleries, museums that had what at one time were considered, um, you know, exquisite international collections of copies. Right. And so at this moment in time, we we automatically devalue or debase the idea of the copy, number one. Um, mm -hmm. So we're always more interested in the original, the authenticity of an original sculpture, let's say. And then so it was, you know, interesting and let's say prov provocative for me to, to learn about this incredible tradition that didn't have those associations with the copy or the reproduction attached to it, meaning that you could have a gallery of all fakes in a certain way that would still be renowned. Um, you know, one thing that, uh, that those galleries wouldn't include would be portions of the process. So while they might be plaster casts, they would not be molds, right? Like they would not be plaster molds um, they would, they would be meant to look exactly like the original. And so if it was a bronze statue originally, then there would potentially be, maybe there would be a plaster mold that would be made somewhere along the way, or it might be, a, it might be a different type of mold with silicone or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and ultimately there might be a plaster cast as a positive that then would be painted again to look like bronze. And I think that what I realized was that the ability to show the process and to validate the process through the, the, let's say the faking of a certain authentic material. You know, we always, bronze is always placed higher than plaster would be in the hierarchy of, of you know, materials out there for in the art world, right? And the, the longevity, there, there are good reasons for it, right? Like, but to actually then take a plaster mold, which is, as you said, meant to be, you know, a part of the process that would typically be discarded and to give that the same finish, the same luster as something that is hopefully fit to be presented in a public park, let's say, right? Or in a civic space, um, while including all of the different, you know, like all the screw holes and everything, are still there inside those plaster casts, right? Like they were not, uh, they were not doctored up or prettied up for exhibition. They were just finished in bronze, right? So it's just the surface that somehow casts them in a different light. We appreciate everything in a different way just because it looks like bronze rather than plaster. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, I, I guess in a way I, I almost struggle not to read it as a kind of metaphor for a, a sort of um, a, a, a kind of veneer of permanence and durability, like covering something with a somehow sort of rickety scaffolding and, and that as a as a as a sort of metaphor for some of the ideas of, of civic infrastructure that you're describing but it it feels like there's actually a more complex way and a more open way in which you're um sort of con considering the nature of like the the copy the original you know the the surface which seems to be like disguising the material as another thing i i don't know i feel like i'm still um, yeah, I mean, one thing is I would, way, maybe, I don't know, go ahead, yes, sir. In my mind, I, I don't imagine um, that, although I'm happy with the, the reference to kind of like folksy craft, 
Like I, I actually don't mind that. I'm not using it as a direct reference to that. I'm not trying to make this feel chintzy in any way. I actually think that the, the visual luster and surface asks us to appreciate both the process, but also the landscape nature in a different way, right? So um, I don't think it was meant to be a metaphor for cheapness. Um, although that we can we can talk about that in a you know in, a, in another realm, right? Yeah. Um, I also think we can maybe get some questions in, and we'll see if we're still waiting for Paula to show up. I know she was in another meeting, but um, maybe I'm curious if anybody in the audience has any questions that they'd like to um, toss out at the moment. And then Dell, you can still jump back in, and we'll hear hear from Paula if she makes it. I've got a question. Hey. Sorry. Hi, Nasty. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm multitasking. Hi, Joshua. How are you? Good. Um, so, so one of the things that I really, really found really gratifying about, I remember we had a conversation about how you were going to show these and, um, and, you know, at, at the time you kind of were sort of uncertain about how it was going to, how it was going to play out. And um, so, so, I, I, I think you made some really, really interesting decisions with the exhibition space. And I want you to kind of expand a little bit on what your aesthetic choices were in terms of like, you know, was this the space that you were offered or did you identify it as, oh, this would be a really excellent space. And, you know, in, and, and in, the, in how you, you formulated the presentation has, has a pretty significant impact on what the experience someone is going to have. Um, and so talk a little bit about how you made those aesthetic decisions and, and, um, and, you know, and how it played out in terms of the syntax of what you're speaking about. That's a great question. And maybe we can just let everybody know Shasti. Um, Shasti is a, an artist based in Buffalo uh, who was able to see me um, in the mad frenzy of trying to move the <laughs> giant and plaster sculptures into a U-Haul um, to get them to Chicago. And so, yeah, all of those questions were, were very much in my brain at the time. And I think, um, you know, with, with Joseph's help, um, some of those curatorial decisions. So, so first of all, I was offered the gallery space and in a way it made, it was perfect in a way because I always had this image of, um, of these plaster casts being exhibited as if this was a traditional cast gallery in a, in a kind of Beaux-Arts um, mm -hmm. sense of that word, where you would walk into you know, a Beaux-Arts building and there would just be a line of sculptures running down in a, in a kind of larger gallery Session. space. <laughs> yeah, so, so that fit perfectly in a way. Um, and then, but then, you know, arriving and, and when the, the pieces, when these giant plaster chunks arrived in Chicago and kind of getting them in the gallery space um, at the School of the Art Institute, then there's another set of decisions that, that need to be made. And I think trying to, I think one of the things that I was interested in doing was presenting these as, num first of all, as vertical um, monoliths in a way that's very different from the ceramic landscape. So reverting back to more traditional understandings of just sculpture and statuary, I was interested in playing into that a little bit while at the same time trying to keep some kind of connection to ideas of landscape. So the sculptures um, kind of alternate between, not it's not every other one, but it's like sometimes they're presented on a pedestal and sometimes they're presented on the ground or in the earth. Um, and then there's, uh, there's kind of this mulch that hides the, the moment where the pedestal meets the, the ground of the gallery floor, right? So this idea that somehow these pedestals or these monoliths can emerge out of the landscape, um, I think was, was also the, the paradox that the project always was debating as to whether or not it was chunks or fragments or a continuous landscape, I wanted to somehow hold that paradox inside the exhibition. Does that, um, does that make sense in terms of answering your question in terms of issues of syntax? It, it, 
in the issue of syntax, I think it, it definitely does. I mean, there's, there's, um, it, it's not the only aesthetic consideration that you made when you were putting it together. Um, what I find particularly interesting is that there's a view, the rotating views behind you, there's this one that kind of has the full, the full panoply. And, um, and it, it has, it's reminiscent of a histogram. And it, it has this kind of like, there's a, there's a graph like aspect to it behind you that, you know, that the decisions that you're making in terms of what to elevate and then what to bring down have a, a cityscape aspect to them that, that, that speaks of that secondary imagery. And I think it, it's a really, really nice reference to that. But, but there's something about the red, <laughs> right? There's something about that red where, where you know, the, the, in terms of what the, the narrative that you're constructing is an apocalyptic narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I, I would agree with that. I think I'm on mute. <laughs> I oh, no, I heard you. Yeah, no, I'm glad I'm not the only one who thinks so because there's something, there's something, you know, that the, 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 the deconstruction also speaks to a level of destruction. And, you know, and what behind you is now, you know, every time I see that, that view is, is the, is the remnants and remains of, of, you know, our, our tragic mistakes made in civilization. <laughs> you know, that there are, there are some really wonderful, it, it resolves really beautifully. And I was just so gratified to see it when, when you sent me the pictures. I was just absolutely thrilled. It's, it's delicious. Yeah, Shasti, just a, a quick follow up on that, like, because it, it's a pretty astute comment on your part. And it was partially intentional and partially not, of course. Um, it was, I think it comes from the Trajan's Hollow book which was dealing with an imperial monument, which has in some ways a, a apocalyptic, apocalyptic his, history, right? Like yeah. it's a monument to genocide. And, 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 but then I'm examining it in, in material terms and all of these other issues. And I think um, uh, Rick Valcenti from Thirst Design, who designed the book um, and the book cover selected that color. And it, and, and it just, it all, as you said, it resolved everything. It made it clear yeah. It acknowledged a certain problematic history in this case, the, the kind of what you call apocalyptic and what, you know, what we can also call imperial still makes sense at this moment in time, right? And so to, to present this and to present the, um, the kind of the fundamental problems of the metropolis at, that, at this moment in that light, I think is still relevant. Well, the, 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 I think the, the, also the thing that you refer to in terms of in terms of deciding what happened on a pedestal, right? Like, like we identify metropolises sheerly out of altitude, right? That altitude winds up being a, a, the, the most significant, um, uh, you know, the, the, it's, it's, it's literally the semiotic tag of metropolis is, is height. And when you bring up Trajan's Hollow and you're talking about, you know, the, the, the fact that it's not just a monument to, to the genocide, but it's a priapic, monument to genocide <laughs> you know that there is that there is an aspect of it with that type of assertion those you know that that you know that that thirst for conquest that height speaks to um and you know and it's the same thing that's happening right behind you right the the the, the taller parts of your skyline that you have created uh, talk about these you know the rise and fall of civilization in a really interesting way and Inimitably, those most vertical aspects of it tend to have this kind of wry allusion to, you know, how masculine <laughs> that toxicity is in a really, really compelling way. So, so yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm really delighted to see how it resolved. Thanks, Shasti. Yeah, I mean that's so that's so interesting. I mean that's such a yeah, that's such a thoughtful read on the piece. I and the I mean the use of color, it's so I mean, I didn't necessarily, I guess, um read all of those implications of the use of color, but it's something that I've I feel like I've noticed in your work for years. I mean, I remember when we first met at the European Ceramic Work Center and there was a series of pieces you were making and there was a color of a kind of a turquoise teal that you were using. And it was such a particular 
choice and it was so apparent like in the work and it and it um just remember it, it striking me in this way that it like it 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 made sense but then the color was also so kind of viscerally operative like within the within the composition and um yeah i'm just i don't know it's it's just interesting to me that kind of that the sort of intuition and the way in which you sort of bring color from one project to another and follow that thread and the way it 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 feels both like it it brings that symbolism and meaning but it also is is striking and disorienting at the same time like i it's something that stops me in my tracks as I'm looking at it and I notice it and I have to think about it and give it time as well. Um, so it feels like you use color in such a, through, through, through a lot of your work in, a, in, in this really powerful way. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's funny, like jo Joseph knows as we were trying to figure out, you know, the, the color to paint that wall, um, that ultimately my way of justifying it was because it's a direct reference to the v &A, um cast courts where you've got these bronze, you know, like faux bronze plaster objects presented against a red that's almost that red, not quite, but it's pretty close. Um, so whether or not anybody else catches it, for me, I'm always happy if there's maybe more of a, yeah, like a direct um, quotation or even direct mimicry, since I'm not so scared of, of reproduction, you know, um, of a historical trope that exists already, right? And then maybe the one little switch that I'm making, besides stealing a lot from a lot of language from a, a kind of traditional or historical cast gallery, is the fact that these are not sculptures, they're molds for sculptures, um, but otherwise they're kind of presented in almost exactly the same way. Uh, I know there's a bunch of friends and colleagues from Buffalo and from elsewhere. In the it audience. looks like there's a question in the chat here. Um, you... uh, about, uh, transit debates. Yeah, um, so I think one of the one of the issues that um, I feel is relevant about this project, not not just from its conception in Sao Paulo, but then also as it as it brings us into the present moment in Buffalo, but elsewhere, as these these moments in time where we um, as a culture, all, all signs seem to point towards one answer. And um, the, the, you know, as I was saying, the moment when everybody uh, felt that the way to go was to rip up these transit systems and switch everything over to private transportation, namely the automobile. Um, but the, you know, the, the gateway uh, modality in there was the public bus, right? Like, so, the trams would be um, converted into buses, which then no longer needed the rails. The rails would be ripped up. Um, the roads would be, you know, subsidized by the federal government. And then ultimately the buses disappear. And what we're left with is just private cars, right? Of, of which not everybody is able to partake. Um, all of a sudden at this moment in time, we are facing a very similar, um, conundrum, let's say, or almost like this moment where for transit planners, all of these arrows are pointing towards rideshare, um, that Uber and Lyft could potentially replace transit, public transit. Um, and we have a very similar decision to make. And there are many people who would come down on, on either side of that. But, um, you know, the idea of what happens when a public infrastructure essentially becomes outsourced um, to, to, to private industry, which then may or may not have the public good in mind, right? And so once, once we let go of these kind of seemingly old fashioned, slow bureaucratic systems, um, what, do, what risks do we expose ourselves to? And I think we are in that exact moment and, and COVID of course um, makes that 
even more present uh, when, it, when everybody is scared to get on public transit. And so ev everybody is on Uber and Lyft even more to get around the city, right? In addition to on the other side of that, there's, there's bicycle and bike share. Can you talk more about the use of the mulch in this in the in this installation? I mean, you talked about it in terms of a way of kind of like, you know, dissipating or dissolving the base of the pedestals, but it also, I mean, it feels like such a specific choice for a for a material and a way of doing that. Um, yeah. So the this I first exhibited the um, the molds as bronze casts in Buffalo um, at a, a kind of ad hoc uh, gallery space owned by um, uh, a, a kind of kind of great person, Fritz, and, and the curator for that, um, a friend and colleague, Jordan Geiger, had the intuition. He brought that into the project, right? So I can't totally take credit for it. I think like maybe like the red it, it's just one of these things where like somebody else really makes the, the observation and maybe the intuitive um, call on it. And then the, the only credit I can claim is that like, I, I hope that I thoroughly integrate it into the project. So by doing the same thing with slightly different mulch actually in, in Chicago, um, which uh, the mulch that we used in Buffalo was shredded tires. And then the mulch that we used in Chicago was actually real mulch, which changed in color over time, uh, brought a kind of um, pungency to the, the gallery space that it, it didn't have before. Um, I think all of those things like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think like, it's, it's hard for me to take full credit for them, but I actually really value what they bring into the project. And I, and I do think like, that Jordan had a kind of keen eye that I was struggling with this um, uh, this relationship between the, the as Shasti said the kind of phallic um, vertical sculpture versus the landscape and for um, for Trajan's Hollow where I started with Trajan's column which you know couldn't be more of there couldn't be a more phallic monument besides that and my immediate response was to make that into a landscape. So my recasting of that monument was to change it from vertical to horizontal. I think that in this project, I wanted to, the transition from the Isochronic Mountain to the Discard Archive exhibition, I was explicitly trying to figure out a way that these things which started as landscapes could work their way back into you know, vertical monuments, but then somehow they needed a vestigial hint of their landscape past. Um, since I wasn't able to, and I decided explicitly not to present them as, as a contiguous, what would have been an isochronic basin, right? Like if I were to assemble all of the molds together, they would produce the inverse mountain um, of the ceramic cast. So I was trying to, I was, I think, trying to use the mulch as a way to, yeah, reference that in. in okay. There's there's a really interesting aspect to that that you just brought up that that also has a relationship to the Trajan Hollow piece, which is essentially what you're doing is you're 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 exploring the interiority of a priapic object in both in both senses, right? That there that that interiority of Trajan's Hollow winds up referring to like you know that which is the opposite of the priapic, right? So like it is the yin to that yang, you know that there's like that idea that you would make a priapic yin, I find really, really compelling. But you're also continuing that with this, that these are the inverse, right? So that 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 notion of not just interiority of of a of a of a mountain, right? That it's inverse has um, has really powerful messaging when you start to think about how those the you know that the fact that, that you're celebrating the mold right that you're celebrating the the cavity and and how the how a cavity speaks of potentiality in a way that that a monument does not right that 
you know, that it's, it's when, when you talk about the notion of cavity and its potential is, is something that winds up being very powerful messaging in and of itself. And so that you just drew that correlation between those two things was really, was really interesting. Hmm. Thanks, Shasti. Yeah, it's funny. Um, the, I, I forget if I ever showed the proposal that I made for um, the Elmwood Bridge in Buffalo, which was meant to be, um, it was literally a monumental sculpture proposal, a public art proposal on these pedestals that, that were given to me as a site. And um, I made, a, I proposed a sculpture of the um, lions that exist on the McKinley Monument at City Hall in Buffalo, but I proposed basically a mold that would produce those lions. So what you're describing right now um, was also something that I literally proposed in Buffalo um, as, as a monument in it some ways. Like you have a theme going. <laughs> I a set of obsessions, right? Um, hey, look, you know, the, the, an artistic practice is like a romantic relationship. <laughs> you know? there's, there's definitely things that are just always going to stay with us. Um, I feel like maybe just because I see Berenica from Los Angeles, a colleague from Woodbury, I wanted to see if I could rope you in to the conversation since you're so good at thinking about materials, landscapes. Uh, I, w I was just... Uh... I, I was too late to say it, but yes, I I, I was going to say the VNA definitely the VNA, the 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 rooms. Uh, but but I like how you've made the color a bit more aggressive than uh, you know the the imperialist um, VNA um, kind of memories of old empire. I guess so. So I like that. I don't know, but I got it, and I think it's it's there. So, um, but there was something else. Um, the the work seems to be like a story within a story within a story. It's, it's, it's not a metaphor. It's not a, uh, it's, it's um, something more ancient. It's something like a medieval um, allegory where um, it is a different reading, but a literal one, but then another one. So it's like, I, I, um, I'm fascinated because we can talk about it through time, through mountains and landscapes, and then through right to the city and this sort of visualization of injustice, let's say. So, so then, if you go on to what Dell said, um, you know, what does um, what does making a filling <laughs> mean um, in in between the the peaks? Um, actually, that's uh, that would be slowing things down, uh, but maybe that's what's happening now. And I wonder, like, if you were to just do a sort of a um, yeah. A, a, even even a, a kind of a sketch on top of that with 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 some with clay like what what would the what would the um you know the pandemic times um uh make would they make uh, would we be in sort of um meadows with walls around us perhaps or something like that it it's interesting spatially what what landscape we would be in um what um what time we would be in as in time seems to, I don't know, either really expand exponentially or, or get really slow um, or, or lose, uh, lose itself. Or, and then also access to the city changes and our rights change and all of that. So, so funny how just this, um, I love it how it can be read on, on, on so many ways. And um, also another observation just quickly, like um, there's something about um, objects that encapsulate or, or um, make physical time and we are fascinated by you know the rings in the tree when we cut them or the the kind of the somebody's you know gold bladder stone that has layers and layers and layers of deposit you know like oh, i would love to see something like that something that uh, grew for a long 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 time whether it's in someone's body whether it's natural whether it's artificial um so there's something about the object that is uh very attractive that way um don't know where I'm going with this, but uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it, I think you're talking about it in one way. For me, I could also read that in another way in that it's been a long project, right? Like it yeah. started, started in 2013 and you know, it started as a, as a baby isochronic mountain. Um, and it has certainly grown over time, but it's also um, maybe in the way that you're talking about like accretion, like it's accumulated mm. more and more 
it's, it's attracted more and more valence, right? Like it, I, I now personally can read it in more ways than I could have when I first started. Um, so the, the artifacts themselves, themselves have increased in number. Along with that, they have, um, because I'm always loath to throw something out, you know, like I've kept portions of the process, right? Like not just the casts, but also the molds um, built on more and more layers, including the bronze layer onto those molds. Um, so, and, you know, even thinking about the ceramics, like I, it, it looked one way before it was glazed, after it was fired, but before it was glazed. Um, and then it, it, something new happens when it's glazed, right? So for me, the project has always kind of accumulated these different readings, um, different layers. Um, I do see that we're joined by Paula. Thank you so much. I know you had to um, r run from another meeting. Um, and maybe Paula, if I, if I may for, for just a minute, just um, introduce why I thought you'd be a great person to respond to the project. Um, Paula runs uh, a studio called Borderless Studio, which Joseph had mentioned. But I think um, when I arrived in Chicago and I, I saw the work that Paula was doing both with her students at SAIC, but then also out in the city, I understood that she was very much interested in map making and GIS, um, geographic information systems, um, that kind of database technology and the visual representation of um, geospatial data, but then also what it means to think about the remnants of, of large um, infrastructural thinking and decay. So Paula has been working um, very consistently in Chicago on trying to figure out what happens with all of the uh, abandoned or decommissioned public schools and how to reoccupy them. So I, th I thought that Paula might be a great person to um, help me read something else into this project. Hi, Paula. Hi, uh, apologies everyone. Um, we had a very long Landmarks Commission meeting today. Um, and I am really excited to be commenting at, at least briefly on, on Joshua's work because um, I've not only been able to um, see this exhibition in real life uh, <laughs> when we were still um, able to enjoy our uh, school spaces, but also being part, like learning on how Joshua's pedagogy uh, and the, the studio work, the class work intersects with this idea of mapping um, and, and thinking of how do we how do we combine research with visuals and how do we create other ways of of reading territory of reading um, historical data of reading um, layers of information that exist in um, in multiple sources so um, I particularly enjoy this exhibition because it's 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 this idea of like how do you take information that only seems to exist in one um, kind of place, like the data, this idea of big data that it's so, um, uh, it's so available yet very unattainable, if that means anything. So like, how do you work with that as a material? How do you work with data as a material and, and use aesthetics to elevate the narrative that some of that data can say? Um, so Joshua, I'm really excited to be at least for a few minutes here and enjoying and celebrating your work. Um, but also having been part of um, your classroom, I think um, the work that you're trying to bring and the, the type of thinking, it's, it's incredibly relevant um, in, in, in the way that imagines other ways to use information that otherwise feels too dense. Mm -hmm. it, it feels very joyful and playful as well. It's funny, I've always, um, I've always had this dichotomy in my mind or just a thought about like, the way data seems to always be represented in um, in RGB, you know, uh, in red, green, and blue, and the idea that it's that it's digital, that it's ethereal, some somehow tr infinite transparency. We can see directly through the city and understand it immediately. And I think I'm somehow more interested in data being represented as pigment, as CMYK, as mm. colors which have opacity, which produce obscurity, right? Like and inaccessibility there there are the data actually the, the way we typically view the data actually produces lots of blind spots right and, um, lots of mapping shadows let's say so i i love the conundrum of like how do we actually 
try to show data as not being all knowing, all seeing, um, and in some ways inherently problematic, but also I, I still am interested in accessing that data and trying to make it visceral um, to the public somehow. You know. And relevant. You yeah. know, it's not only relevant for us, but how can we make it relevant for others? Yeah. Yeah, I think that resonates with me because I come from also a planning practice. I think urban planners have done a very good job at making planning boring. Not all of them, not all of us. But um, I think it's similar with data, this, this thing that it's, it's so rich and so exciting, but not necessarily to everyone. So like, how do we bring it into ways in, in, into the realm of you know, artistic practice to make it relevant um, and, 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 you know, and pleasant? I think there's, there's the, the, the pieces that are in your background that are incredibly you know, intricate, but they, the process where they come from, um, I think that's that's the joyful part of discovery and inquiry about like what is this what is this data making literally and like figuratively. Hmm. I mean, I I feel like this maybe this is a stretch, but I, I don't know. I'm still thinking about the mulch in this piece and 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 what the mulch brings and and there's oh, this way in which I feel like this this. Uh, the, the piece as a whole, I mean, is very much engaged in questions that have to do with the nature of debris. Um, like when, you know, when, like when, when the discarded as parts of a cast or a process like become like simple debris, you know, or, or, or when data, right, just become sort of like clutter, like sort of meaningless clutter. And there, there's this way in which though, and maybe this is where the joyful and the playful like comes into this practice where there, there's a kind of a, a way in which you seem to sort of joyfully and playfully like re-engage with, with the debris, even after it feels like it's, it's um, I don't know, like maybe would have sort of returned to that realm of kind of pure stuff. Like there's a way in which that, that um, I don't know that that care and and attention you sort of bestow upon it um, feels like it it sort of reinvigorates that debris with 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 its own capacity to to continue to tell those stories, um, which mm -hmm. I, I feel like um, Berenica you so sort of beautifully described. Mm -hmm. As an aside, the mulch was deposited this week at a community garden adjacent to a appropriately distanced transit stop in my neighborhood where transit goers tread over as a shortcut to the train stop. Thank you, Joseph. The project finally has come full circle. Exactly. Yeah, Del, Del um, I don't know if I can respond to that directly, but what it makes me think of was the other part of the research that I, that I don't necessarily, that I haven't I've never exhibited necessarily, but the initial, um, one of the, my initial thoughts was that I also, when I first arrived in Buffalo, I uh, just kind of like got a bike from bike share and I just followed all of the old tram routes to see if I could find any that were still extant, to find, to see if I could um, prove that there actually was this tram system. And as I said, everything has been paved over um, and so you can't find anything except after a good freeze thaw and at which moment the streets kind of, the potholes in the street start to reveal remnants of the old um, rails. And so I was able to find some and produce digital scans. And, you know, in my brain, I had the idea that one day I would digitally fabricate and produce a cast of one of these, um, of one of the rails embedded and covered with all of these layers of, of history, you know, revealing this hidden infrastructure that is still there in Buffalo, but that most people drive over every day without, without knowing. Yeah, that's so interesting, right? Like the, the layers of the erasure or like the layers of things that were there, um, yeah. I, I also, I was reflecting on um, what I would have said today um, if I was here earlier, but this idea of um, the unfinished or like the sense of unfinished, 
uh, one of the very funny questions or it becomes very often um, is, you know, this piece of a map of Chicago I made in a parking lot in one of the close schools and folks um, like see us painting often. It's like, when are you going to finish? <laughs> like, and then I asked back, like, what do you, what is finished for you? Right. So this idea of like what it means finish, like one couple of things, one, the idea of representation of the finished and what is that and how to interpret that but also like the idea of this type of work this type of installation needs to look finished so i i you know i, I just very playfully ask back like what do, what does it mean finished for you um but the perception that something is unfinished and that how it's unsettling because it's not being one person but <laughs> constantly people ask how when are you going to finish I don't know if that happens in your work because a lot of your pieces seem like, you know, there's different data and like, I don't know, there's a lot many um, elements of the data that you basically decide when it, you want to stop, right? You have to like, okay, I just I'm going to work with this and make something. But um, I, I just thought that was a fascinating uh, aspect of this, like the idea of the finished. Yeah, I want to quick, I know Del has to leave soon, so I want to just say thanks, Del, for, for joining us. I really appreciate your, your brain and insight on, on this long project. Thank you so much for the invitation. That was such a fun, inspiring conversation. Thanks, everyone. Sorry, I have to go. And maybe quickly to respond to Paula, one of the things I can imagine is that because of the scale you've chosen for that map, like it's huge, it's almost a city block or something like that large. Um, of course, there's always room for more detail, right? Like you could, you could keep adding to that map um, for for quite a number of years into the future, right? Since it's not quite full scale, but almost. It's just the idea of like having things completed or incomplete depends who you're asking. Yeah, and and when so I mean I it's interesting because of course I did exhibit. The, these casts in Buffalo before, and, uh, and now I'm just exhibiting them again, but it changes completely. The context is quite different. Um, the presentation of them and therefore the reading of them is, is very much different between those two. So even though in some ways, maybe those artifacts are completed, the project is still not completed, right? It still keeps on taking on um, different interpretations. So um, I would be happy this, you know, this was meant to, we didn't get to have a gallery opening or a gallery closing except for this. So I'm happy um, for anybody who feels like just allowing this to devolve into um, kind of gallery chit chat um, and maybe end the more formal end of things. But I appreciate that so many people were able to show up and that people who have seen this project in various phases, whether it's in California and Buffalo, discussions about it um, somewhere on the road. Um, so thanks to anybody, to everybody and anybody who wants to kind of like stick around and just um, have a gallery chat, uh, please do so. Thank you to Paula, to Joseph, um, and to SAIC. Thank you. Hi, Henny. Hi, Joshua. I'm just curious, you know, you were mentioning, you know, the, the decision to leave the imperfections and the kind of witness marks, you know, within the process of making the molds. But, you know, when I want to think of the cities and what, what becomes erased when people do representations of city maps or, you know, formal kind of communications about um, urban context, there is so much of the subversive, you know, um, effort in, in how we navigate cities. The, the quick corners people cut, you know, the under, under the, you know, wacker drive, you know, um, quick shortcuts that people take that are the informal or more subversive strategies. Hmm. And I was curious, you know, if, if, if those kind of witness marks are um, incorporated within the data or deliberately excluded, and how one can, you know, make those other kinds of itineraries and experiences also visible as an equally important you kind of witness mark of the process? That's a great question. And people would ask me, you know, I had a uh, whole group of 
um, student assistants that were helping us at various phases. And there was always this question like how, you know, I had, I had set up this expectation in a certain way that we would be taking this data from this GIS data and translating it into, you know, very refined, intricate and um, precise model, right? But then of course, like um, when you're milling in foam or casting with plaster and then clay, you know, the material can only, you know, hold a certain dimension and then it breaks off. So, so there's parts of the data that were lost. There are other parts of the data that were reinterpreted by the materials. And in a way, I, I think that's, for, for me, that was all a part of this process, right? Like that you take a snapshot of, of the data at, at literally at one moment in time, because um, the mountain mm -hmm. is from 9.15 on a Tuesday morning in Buffalo. Now we know that there are many other parts of the day and the week that people are taking public transit. And so you can only ever take that as something that's kind of anecdotal, right? Like the, because it's just one, one segment of the population and one moment in time. So of course, to me, it makes sense that then the materials also take the data for a walk a little bit, right? Like they, they start to produce something which is more intricate and maybe unexpected. I mean, of course, the data is unexpected to begin with. Like I, I would find these anomalies where, you know, the topography would look unexpected. And so I would need to drive out to these different parts of the city to try to understand why there were these areas that were either hyper accessible, accessible or hyper inaccessible that I couldn't explain it kind of rationally. Um, so I do, th I do think that like the process, the material process was meant to alter the data, right? To produce a story at the end of the day that is somewhere between the generic and, um, and then a kind of more uh, personal idiosyncratic anecdotal version of what it means to move through the city. And that could have come through interviewing and asking many, many people. But I also think that the, the material and what you're calling witness marks brings a little bit of that language automatically into, into these forms. Yeah, one wishes that you could, you know, create backpacks for the bureaucrats, you know, to carry the weight of the bronzes, you know, through the landscape. <laughs> right. <laughs> Hello, Angelo. Sorry, I, I cut you off. What was that, Henny? No, 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 we're just saying, you know, thank you very much. It was such a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much, Henny. I loved what Paola was saying about finish, like the, the idea that you would just call it finished at a certain point um, in a sort of bad infinity of how much data can actually be incorporated. Um, and by, by bronzing it, you embalm the data in a certain way, you're freezing it in a certain moment in time, but you're also monumentalizing that that shard of time um, in this, this moment of the great unevenness of access to navigating the city. Um, and so it ends up sort of monumentalizing something that the city wants to deny. The city wants to boldly, if you did this in Chicago, it'd be amazing because the South Side would be so um, under accessible, it would be so underserved. Um, and yet, Chicago loves to brag about the CTA and how, how great it is. Um, so it just, it is sort of subversive and it is a, like just apocalyptic while, while taking on the garb of the imperial finish. And um, I think this conversation brought that out and Paola's astute remark about the essentially pun. Um, it's, it's a pun on the material. It's a pun on the figurative using the material. So that's really weird to like to use the literal finish to pun on the figurative um, finish. Right, I mean, it's funny when you're saying that the embalming, the thing that I'm thinking of is when people get 
their kids' baby shoes cast in bronze, you know, or bronzed. And, you know, what would it, what would it mean to do that at a more awkward phase, you know, like to, to kind of bronze the teenage, the, sh the shoes that you wore as a teenager that, that, that hold, you know, hold in there all of the, the problems and anxieties, um, small mindedness, but still hope, uh, you know, and um, yeah, I, 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 I do think that the tr trying to capture this thing in a moment, right? And, and in some ways that moment is very precisely selected, but in then other ways, it's quite arbitrary. It's just a stopping point. Um, if let's say certainly the data was at a precise moment, it was just embalmed, but then um, the plaster uh, was finished with the bronze finish basically just when I stopped producing ceramic casts, but I also could have produced more ceramic casts. I decided to produce two mountains out of that set of molds. And so one is in Buffalo and one is in Chicago now. Um, but I, I could have also continued and produced more. And then those molds would have changed over time and they would have looked different at the moment that they were finished in, in bronze. Yeah, I have to exit on the, on the notion of embalming the awkward. Um, that was just brilliant. I love that. I have to go because I have to engage with the child and at that very awkward stage where I'm I'm right now trying to figure out what I will bronze of hers. <laughs> that, that would that would meet that. That was beautiful. Thank you, Joshua. I'm Thanks, really, Jasmine. really I'm so happy to have attended. I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you. You've been such a wonderful kind of part of this project from Oh my God. I was just it was such an honor to even be able to see the little glimpses and you know, the private glimpses I got to see were just marvelous. It was marvelous. I'm glad. I'm so glad it would turned out. Thank see you. Later. Bye. Oh my mic was muted. How heavy is one of those things? Well, they, they vary quite a bit uh, in their size. So some of the smaller ones are maybe just like 15, 20 pounds. Mm. But the, the taller, bigger ones are probably closer to like 75 pounds or something like that. They're, they're difficult. They're difficult mm -hmm. to move around right now. They were even worse to maneuver as molds when they actually had three other parts because they all needed to have you know, plaster walls around them also to cast the ceramic objects into. So they were even bigger before as molds. Mm -hmm. um, each one of those would, would receive kind of like three dumb plaster walls. So the only parts that I kept were the parts that were specific to the, um, to the landscape, but then just the, the kind of dumb plaster walls, I let those go. But you can imagine that then trying to overturn and maneuver and work with one of those molds was ridiculous. Um, and I had a lot of um, muscle power from helpers outside of myself. I couldn't couldn't have done that on my own. Ingalil, you made it. Thank you for <laughs> shut, <laughs> shuttling over. It's a little yeah. embarrassing. I wish I could see the images behind your head. So, and I've seen, of course, the images. I'm sorry I missed the presentation, but you can give a little private one to me later. No problem. But. The, there's the five minute video, which I'll send you. You can watch that. And then That'd be awesome. And it's really good to see Jennifer, Jen too. Hi, Jen. <laughs> Trying to figure out what's, what's the rest of the poster behind your head. <laughs> okay. It's actually pretty appropriate uh, that when Jen first came on with that image behind her, I actually thought that was, I didn't read the text, but uh, when we were first in Sao Paulo, where the entire project started, we landed that there on a day of massive protest about transit infrastructure, right? So that's kind of what, that was the inception of the project. And so at first I thought that's what Jen was um, displaying behind her. I didn't get good photos of those protests, which is yeah. the most tragic thing ever but when there are literally military tanks coming down the street and everyone is partying in the street at that moment it wasn't the first thing to take a picture with a terrible cell phone camera and we were advised not to take real cameras which was 
pretty good advice because one of our phones got got stolen and yeah it was a crazy time so we don't tragically don't have good images of those protests that were sort of one spring of the project um, it was a transit hike that caused those massive protests that swept throughout Brazil it was a uh, um, was if I'm remembering correctly 15 cents on a ride and this just exploded into an overall um, protest against the way the entire country was being run which unfortunately has only continued to devolve right. in a much worse way so that was um, those seem like harbingers at the moment Veronica, thank you for coming to this opening. You've also it was, seen a, was very nice, very nice walk through virtual. Our, um, our Wuho space, we've also had some isochronic mountains in there. <laughs> yeah, are they still there? Like yeah, under yeah. layers and layers of uh, pigeon poo. <laughs> there's, there's some remnants there, yeah, for sure. Exactly. There's, uh, yeah, there's more um, organic material that is accumulating on top mm. of the geological stratum. Embalming, embalming exactly. the the fossils of time. Exactly. Even better. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you heard uh, Joseph at the beginning was talking about what types of creatures might have been living in the mulch, uh, um, without our knowledge during during the COVID. Oh. Abandonment, the mothballing of the exhibition for six months or something. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it, it has an inertia in it because of right. its weight. So how far, where is the show traveling to? <laughs> very, very, very slowly through like a uh, horse driven carriage. Somehow it moves at a geological pace. Mm -hmm. that's, that's good. Maybe we say good night and thanks to everybody for coming out to the, to the gallery. Bye everybody. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye, Linda. Thanks for, thanks for showing up. Bye, Jen. Nice to see you. <laughs>